Medical devices are not without risk. Despite our best effort in safe design, manufacturing control, labeling, and use instructions, there are many reports of malfunctions and injuries in the field. On the other hand, medical devices have saved lives and made a big difference in the quality of life for millions of people around the world. This is the benefit risk for medical devices that drives their advancement and approval by the FDA and other regulatory bodies around the world. But how do you do a benefit risk analysis? It's not an exact science. Hello and welcome. I'm Naveen Agarwal and I help medical companies build safe products through a quality management system that is not just compliant, but also focused on the needs of patients and doctors. So call me or email me with your questions and let me know how I can help you. In this video, I'm going to offer a few thoughts on benefit risk analysis of medical devices within the context of an example to better understand how you could make some of the decisions to move forward even when there is some risk involved. If you have implemented ISO 14971, the international standard for risk management of medical devices, you're already familiar with the requirement around benefit risk analysis. This happens after you have implemented your risk controls and you are evaluating the remaining amount of risk and balancing against the benefits that the device provides. There is some guidance in TR 24971, but it is not an exact science and involves a little bit of a judgment. How do you do this? Well, every organization has to figure that out and it is best done in a cross-functional team with the appropriate level of subject matter expertise. Let's first look at some guidance from the FDA. Analyzing benefit risk is a balancing act and requires a judgment call based on all available data, prior experience, nature of the circumstances, and type of risk. In a 2016 guidance document, FDA recommends a few factors for analysis of benefits and risks. For example, when looking at benefits, consider the type and magnitude of the benefit. Who is benefiting? And how many people are affected? Is it a temporary relief from symptoms? Or does it provide long-lasting relief against a chronic condition like diabetes? Does this device help treat a life-threatening condition and improve the likelihood of survival? Can it save someone from dying? Now, when looking at risks, consider the severity of harm and type of injury. Is it permanent or a temporary effect? Does use of the device involve complicated steps which may result in use errors or procedure-related complications? If it's a diagnostic device, then consider the risks of false positives and false negatives. At times, the benefit-risk analysis may need to be done at an individual patient level. How long has the patient been suffering and what is the intensity of pain? Risk tolerance may be different for different patients based on their circumstances. And high-risk devices may be approved for limited use by a narrow patient group in some situations. Finally, benefit risk is relative to other available alternatives. There may be other devices or procedures that provide the same benefit, but at a higher risk. In those situations, your device can be acceptable if you can reduce the level of risk by implementing additional controls. Let's consider an example to look at some of these points. Currently, there is a massive health crisis going on across the world caused by the new coronavirus pandemic. Now, there is an acute shortage of PPE in the hospitals. It includes the N95 respirators, which are routinely used by the staff and first responders. In typical situations, they are supposed to be single-use disposable respirators. But because of this acute shortage, there is news that staff has to stretch the use of these respirators and in some cases even reuse them over and over again for days. Clearly, there's a, this is a very high-risk activity. But there is no supply of fresh respirators. And even though many manufacturers have announced their plans to scale up production, it is still not available in the marketplace. 
Recently, FDA has authorized emergency use of a decontamination system for N95 respirators that utilizes vapor phase hydrogen peroxide. This system has been shown to be very effective against killing microorganisms, some of them even the most resistant ones like bacterial spores. But they don't have any data against the new coronavirus. So as a result, there is an element of risk, but it's a good low risk option to move forward and I will discuss how that decision can be analyzed. The risk of using a reprocessed N95 respirator using a decontamination system like this is higher than using a pristine N95 respirator fresh out of the pack. As a result, we have to look at the potential benefit in the context of the lack of availability and the current practices that healthcare staff has to follow because of that. Compared to reusing or stretching the use of the same respirator for a long period of time, using a decontaminated respirator carries lower risk. Certainly higher than the pristine respirator, but a little bit lower than what they are doing today. The benefit is the same. It provides protection. And the last thing we want is our healthcare staff to get sick because then they won't be able to care for patients. So in this context, the benefit risk is favorable. But if the supply catches up with the demand and new respirators begin to flow in into the hospitals and healthcare clinics, then this system doesn't offer the same level of benefit risk balance. So in conclusion, benefit risk analysis is challenging because it involves a little bit of a judgment based on all available data, the situation, and the nature of the risk. One thing to keep in mind is that the benefit risk analysis is not done in vacuum. It's relative to something else. Unfortunately, there is no set formula that you can use to a very robust statistical analysis and come up with a number. It's best done in a cross-functional team setting where you can bring in the right, right level of expertise. Especially, you need to involve your medical safety staff or experts who can appropriately guide the benefit-risk discussion. As we saw before, in some situations, you will need to move with a high-risk device and make a decision which you may not be 100% comfortable with. In those situations, it is best to set up additional surveillance and follow-up so you can keep an eye on how things are evolving. As an example, every emergency use authorization letter from FDA requires manufacturers to report adverse events on a weekly basis. That's a good decision because when we are moving ahead with high-risk decisions, we need to follow up and take action before anyone gets hurt. Thank you for your interest and attention. If you like this video, subscribe to my channel. Please visit my website www.exceedqm.com to learn more about this topic. I have an article on my blog that goes into a lot more detail and offers more guidance. So I invite you to check that out. I also invite you to sign up for my monthly newsletter which provides industry insights, regulatory developments, takes only 15 minutes to catch up and it's absolutely free.